Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, and good night. It is so good to see all of you here for the reading uh, on here on the JB Font channel. So good to see you. I'm your host, James Fauntleroy. As always, is once another reading. And so we're going to be getting into that. It's nice to have you. Just guys, let you guys know, JB Font channel is available on all major podcast platforms like Anchor, Apple, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. So you can subscribe to me there. I'm also part of the Revolutionary Blackout Network. So you can catch me on the JB Show on Sundays at 1, on RBN Live on Tuesdays at 4, and the Savvy and JB Show on Thursdays at 6. Now, if you are new to the channel, and you like what you're hearing, you like what you're watching, please make sure to give me a thumbs up so that this tells the algorithm that not only don't you do you like it, but you it also puts it out there for more people to find this content as well. Thank you to everyone who's a patron on Patreon and Coffee, as well as to all the members. And thank you to anyone who sends me mutual aid via the various platforms that are linked in the description as well. Today, we're talking and reading about Asada Shakur and her autobiography. So we're going to be starting in chapter five. We're doing chapter five, part one, and we're going to be reading in this today. This is actually very interesting because this goes back into Asada Shakur's incarceration and more about what's going on now. Of course, in chapter four, what we had just covered, we were talking about Asada Shakur's early life and going through puberty. Now we're back into going through her incarceration as well as her going through her court battles as well. This is actually a really good reading. Uh, and this is actually going to be more insight into what she has went through. We're going to be starting on page 80. So we're going to be starting on page 80, of which is chapter five. And we're going to be reading to page 89. So we're going to be covering this in two parts. So I'm going to do this. I'm splitting this chapter in two parts because it's slightly lengthy. And so I don't want to make this too long of a video. It gets kind of lengthy. And then sometimes your you know attention starts to wane a little bit. And I want to make sure that we cover these chapters so that you get all the information and it's more digestible for you to basically here in this video. So this is going to be very interesting to say the least. This is a, actually a really good video to get into. So chapter five, Asada Shakur's autobiography on page 80. We're starting here. So let's begin. All right, Chessmart. Pack your things. You're being moved. Moved? Where? You'll find out when you get there. Then I'd like to call my lawyer. You can call your lawyer when you get where you're going. I kept trying to find out where they were taking me. The continuation of the Jersey trial after the change of venue to Morristown was still a month away. Maybe they were just moving me ahead of time. Maybe they were just trying to take me back to the workhouse. I wasn't too worried, though. Anywhere was better than the basement in the Middlesex County Jail. The sheriff came down with a piece of paper in his hand. Where am I going? I asked him. I have a federal order to re I'm sorry. I have a federal order to produce you, he said, waving the paper around. You're being turned over to the custody of the federal government. What for? I don't know. You'll have to ask the feds. My abrupt transfer from one jail to another without either notice to my lawyers or explanation to me was a scenario that I wasn't that was to be repeated over and over again during the next few years. After our motion for a change of venue from Middlesex County was granted on October 1973, I was returned to the basement of the Middlesex County Jail, where I believe I would remain until the trial resumed in Morris County on January 4th, 1974. Evelyn immediately swung into action, contacting the National Jury Project to explore the level of racism in Morris County 
and preparing a number of motions she anticipated would have been made before the Morris County Court. In addition, she was working on the continuous motion to remove me from solitary confinement in a Middlesex County jail that was then before the New Jersey Federal District Court. The underlying argument of the motion that this kind of confinement destroyed my ability to adequately participate in the preparation for my trial had to be supported by psychological data and the opinions of experts. Evelyn was trying to find psychologists and sociologists willing to provide their professional assessments in support of the motion. She was also trying to locate a forensic pathologist, a ballistics expert, a forensic chemist, and other specialists needed for the trial and trying to raise money to pay them. I was aware that there were two indictments outstanding against me for alleged bank robberies. Evelyn had been told that for trials, for these charges would follow the trial in New Jersey. One of the indictments was for a Bronx bank robbery that occurred in September, 1972. I had been indicted for this crime along with Kamal, Avon White, and others in federal court, Southern District of New York, located in Foley Square in Lower Manhattan. I knew that Evelyn had made the motion before the Southern District Judge, Gigliardi, and I'm sorry, to have that trial postponed until after the termination of the jury trial, the Jersey trial. Having learned that the motion had been granted, I didn't connect the move to New York with the bank robbery trial. I was wrong. The trip was a usual high security, endless procession of cars. And as usual, I enjoyed the ride. Just a walk from the door of the jail to the car did me good. It had been so long since I seen the daylight or breathed fresh air. I looked at the trees and the grass and the sky as if I'd never seen them before. It was a gloriously beautiful day. When the feds told me that they were taking me to New York to go to trial, I didn't know what in the world was going on, but I was sure Evelyn would straighten things out. There was no way in hell I would go to trial in federal court, not unless they gave us time to prepare for it and canceled the jury, Jersey trial. There was no way that Evelyn could deal with both trials at the same time. She was working so hard, and I couldn't keep track of all that she was doing. I knew we had arrived somewhere in Queens, but I didn't know where. There was no courthouse in the direction we had gone. The car came to a bridge where pigs were stationed, pointing rifles and shotguns. On the other side of the bridge, there were more police. Where are we? What is this place? You're now on Rikers Island. This will be your new home for a while, the marshal told me. It'll never be my home. I looked around while they waited for clearance to pass through the gate. There were huge, ugly buildings in front of us, not old or dilapidated as I had imagined when I pictured Rikers Island, but institutional looking never nevertheless. Are all these buildings jails? I asked. Yep, said the marshal. They're all jails. There are a lot of criminals in the world. Everybody isn't a criminal, I told him. And they've got a lot of criminals locking people up. They got a gang of criminals in the White House. The marshal just grunted. The car turned into a modern brick building. There were no old fashioned bars, just jealous window bar combinations. I was brought into a large receiving room and locked into one of the small rooms that lined the sides, empty except for some benches and a dirty bathroom. After a, a long wait, I was taken out to be printed and photographed. I was returned to the room, then called out again to fill out forms. I immediately got into a hassle about the forms. I had left the line for address blank. Where do you live? I don't live anywhere. I'm in jail and I've been put in jail for six months. Well, where do you live before that? I don't remember. And it wasn't a lie. 
I remembered the place, but I couldn't even begin to tell anyone the address. While I was underground, I made it a habit to never remember addresses. I used landmarks to remember a place, and I never had trouble locating any place I had been to once. But even if I visited for a long locate, but even if I visited it a hundred a hundred times, I never looked at the address. Well, what does your where does your mother live? Why? We need an address. I haven't lived with my mother in years. Well, give me the address anyway. I don't know if my mother would want you to have her address. I'll have to ask her. The guard insisted, but that line was left blank. The guard was a black woman with a nafro, and there was another one next to her with a lopsided wig on. She was black too. In fact, most of the guards I had seen so far were black. I was quickly to find out that the overwhelming majority of guards in the female jail at Rikers are black. And when they open their mouths and express their opinions, you wonder. But that's another story. That's kind of interesting. A lot of times people think that just because they share the same color as us, that they're going to be more sympathetic to us. Thing is, is that as you see from people like Kamala Harris, all skin folk and kin folk, right? <sighs> Such is life. After I had been waiting for what seemed like hours, they brought in a whole bunch of women. It was wonderful. They were real live people talking and laughing. It had been so long since I had ever even heard a conversation. I just sat there staring at them. I know I must have looked like I was crazy, staring like I was, but I just couldn't help it. I was overwhelmed. I could barely talk though. When someone asked my name, I, I stammered and stuttered. My voice was so low. Everything, everyone constantly asked me to repeat myself. That was one of those things that always happened for me after a long periods of solitary confinement. I would forget how to talk. The next phrase was to strip and search. There were two groups of women, those who were turn, returning from court and those who, like me, were new admissions. We were directed to stand in front of little booths and take off all of our clothes. Trigger warning, by the way. Then we were told to turn around, squat, and run our fingers through our hair lift up our feet and open our mouths. This was for everybody. The next step was only for the new admissions. They put us in shower stalls without curtains. We were told to take a shower and then we were given this stuff, which they told us to put in our hair and our pubic hairs and wash with it. What is this for? I asked. It's for lice and crabs, Garda said. It was humiliating. The last stage was the search. Every woman who came into the building had to go through this process, even if she had been nowhere but to court. Joan Bird and Afini Shakur, Afini Shakur is Tupac's mother, by the way. Tupac Shakur's mother. Joan Bird and Afini Shakur had told me about it after they had been bailed out in the Panther 21 trial. When they had told me, I was horrified. You mean they really put their hands inside you to search you, I had asked? Uh-huh, they had answered. Every woman who has ever been on the rock or in the old house of detention can tell you about it. The women call it getting the finger or more vulgarly, getting finger effed. I had to watch my language because the new terms of service with YouTube. So I can't say the full word, but you know what it means. What happens if you refuse? I asked the Finney. They lock you in the hole and they don't let you out until you consent to be searched internally. I thought about refusing, but I sure as hell didn't want to be in the hole. I had enough of solitary. 
the internal search was humiliating and disgusting, as disgusting as it sounded. You sit on the edge of this table and the nurse holds your legs open and sticks a finger into your vagina and moves it around. It has a pla she has plastic gloves on. Some of them tried to put one finger in your and another one up your rectum at the same time. Anyway, it had I had an instant mile-long attitude. I wanted to punch the nurse clear into oblivion. Afterward, the guards had the nerve to tell me that a mistake had been made and the doctor would have to make a complete examination. I was just too disgusted. He was a filthy looking man who looked more like a Bowery bum than a doctor. He coughed all over me without even covering his mouth and his fingernails looked like he had spent the last five years in a coal mine. The only good thing about him was that he was quick. He rattled diseases off like he was an auctioneer and asked me if I had them. Then he gave me a one minute examination, took my blood and that was it. I was kept in the receiving room until long after everyone had left. Then a pleasant enough guard with a scar on her nose and mouth took me to my cell. We went down the corridor that seemed to be a mile long hallway where guards sat inside a glass cage. Buttons and knobs and lights decorated the cage. It looked like an inside of some kind of spaceship. Open up five. The guard who had bought me said. There was a thumping sound and then a humming sound and then nothing. You can go to your room now. Go where? I asked. Just walk down the hall and the door will be open. You'll see it. The hallway was long. I got to the cell. The light came on. When I went in, and the door slid the door slid shut behind me. It was something out of a science fiction movie. The long halls, the sliding door, the control panel. Space jail, I said to myself. Inside, there was a cot, a dirty sink, a seatless toilet, and a roll of toilet paper. I was tired and wanted to go to sleep. I'm turning the light out now, the voice over the microphone. The light went out, but a yellow light stayed on. Turn the little light off, please. I called to the guard. Again, a voice came over the microphone. The light must stay on. It is there for your own protection. The light stayed on, and I went to sleep. Morning. The door slid open. Breakfast, ladies. Came over the microphone. It was early, but I was anxious to get dressed and looked around. The first thing that hit me was the smell. I didn't care what jail I've been in. They all stink. They all have a smell unlike any smell on earth, like blood and sweat and feet and open sores. And if misery had a smell, like misery. The walls of the cells were covered with obscenities and love decorations. Apache loves Carmen, Linda and Little Bit, India and Rosa, true love always. From the window, I could see a small paved yard with grass growing between the cracks of in the pavement and then another long building. A few women were in the day room, but most stayed in their cells, which was barren except for the toothpaste writing that covered the walls. In prison, toothpaste serves many functions one of which is glue to hang up pictures. A few of the cells were fixed up with pictures from magazines hung on the walls and a knitted or crocheted afghan on the bed. Clothes and cardboard boxes were on the floor. The women looked evil and ashen. They glanced at me with only vague interest and went about their business. They were all black or Hispanic. I took a shower and spent the rest of the morning walking back and forth. Some of the women were bloated with swollen hands and feet. A few were real strange look upon them. One sat in a chair 
her eyes crusted with sleep, giggling quietly to herself. A group of women sat at a table playing spades. They asked me if I wanted to play and said I had never heard of the game, volunteered to teach me. It turned out to be like whist, only spades are always trumps. Then it was lock it was lock in time again. The second one for the day. The first had come after breakfast. There were two women on either side of me who had been locked in their cells all day. Don't you want to come out? I asked stupidly. They all broke up laughing. No, <laughs> one said. I like it here. When she stopped laughing, she told me who when she told me she was locked. That meant she was locked into her cell until she had been seen by the board. What's the board, I asked. It's the disciplinary board. When you get an infraction, they lock you up until you see the board. Then they let you out? Sometimes, but we're going to PSA. What's that? It's the hole, the brick, I'm sorry, the bing. This is too main, where you go before they take you to the board. Then, after that, if they think you haven't done enough time down here, they send you to PSA. PSA stands for Punitive Segregation Area. Solitary. You mean you don't stay in this part all the time? No, we're on the sentence side. We only had to come here because we stole in the medication. We stole almost everything in the medication truck and drank it. Coke almost OD. That's why we're down here. This part is for the people who have infractions or for crazy people. Crazy people? Yeah. The one named Coke answered. They got some real bugs down here. How come you here? I don't know. I got here yesterday and this is where they put me. You got a homicide? A homicide? Yeah, a homicide. You here for murder? I have a homicide case in New Jersey, but I'm here for a bank robbery trial. That's probably why they got you down here, they speculated. They're probably going to move you soon. They asked a million questions. Who did you kill? I didn't kill anybody. Well, who did they say you killed? A cop, a New Jersey State Trooper. Oh, snap. I can't curse. Oh, snap. You're going to have a hard way to go. You didn't really do it. No. You got a bank robbery, too? Did you rob a bank? How much money did you get? I didn't get any money because I didn't rob the bank. Yeah? Then your boyfriend did it and put the blame on you? No. I don't have a boyfriend. Oh, so you like girls funny. They laugh. You kind of cute. You want to go with me? One of them joke. You ever do time before? No, never. You got any other cases? Yeah, I have another bank robbery. Did you do that one? No. Well, damn. They got you all hooked up. The one called Dolores said. How come they're trying to frame you up like that? Because I'm a revolutionary. They say that I'm in the Black Liberation Army. Oh, oh, I know you. You that girl I read about in the papers. Yeah, what's your name? Asada, Asada Shakur. But my slave name is Joanne Cherismart. Yeah, you the one. I never thought I'd meet you. How you doing? Yeah, Coke said. I saw your picture on TV, but you look different now. How, I asked. When I saw your picture, I thought you were much bigger and much blacker too. <laughs> really? I asked. It was that statement I heard over and over. Everybody told me they thought I was bigger, blacker, and uglier. When I asked people what they thought I looked like, they would describe me as about someone six feet tall, 200 pounds, and very dark, but wild looking. Bad as them papers said you was, I just knew you looked bad, and here you are, just a little old thing. I asked them what they were in prison for. In the course of the next few days, 
I was to learn a whole new vocabulary. Jostling was pickpocketing. Boosting was shoplifting. Juggling paper was writing bad checks. And dragging or playing drag was conning. Later that evening, a woman who had just come in from court told me that Phyllis wanted me to come to the gym at 8.30. I was overjoyed. I heard that Simba was on the rock, but I thought they might have moved her to make sure that no chance, uh, we had no chance to be together. The gym was large when we were playing handball and basketball, dancing, sitting in the bleachers and talking. Finally, behind a clump of women, I saw Simba. We embraced each other and just sat there trying to get all the words that that we were that were in our hearts. So we had much happened since we were we had seen each other. We had been close when we were both members of the Black Panther Party. For a while we had lived together. She was always real earthy sister with a with a heart of gold. She told me about her case about the other comrades she was in touch with, and then that she was pregnant. Homie was her nickname for her lover, the baby's father. Kakuyan, Kakuyan Olubala. He was a beautiful revolutionary brother, and he was murdered by the New York police. Kakuyan and I had gotten it to know each other pretty well while we were both at Harlem branch of the Black Panther Party. He was one of the brothers who, in the days of the Black, I'm sorry, the Panther Party's lumpen ideology would have been called lumpen. He was raised in Harlem around 116th Street and 8th Avenue and re, a relaxed, easy kind of person, but a fighter to the heart. He loved weapons and was a genius with them. I was glad about her pregnancy and sad at the same time. He, she was facing 25 years. Although I tried to be cheerful, I guess she could see the concern expression on my face. Sorry, hearing stuff. Anyway. Don't worry, she told me. Those people can lock us up, but they can't stop life just like they can't stop freedom. This baby was meant to be born, to carry on. They murdered homie. And so this baby, like all of our children, is going to be our hope for the future. I would think about her words many times later. It's early in the morning. It feels like a quarter to zero and I wanted to sleep. I hear my name vaguely over the microphone. Something about court. They're calling me for court. Hurriedly, I rolled out of bed, showered, dressed, combed my hair, and I'm ready to go. They bring me breakfast on the troop food truck. I can't even stand the look of food, much less eat anything. All right, court ladies, time to go to the receiving room. The microphone wails. It's too early in the morning for that thing. I wanted to tear it out of the ceiling. I stumbled down the receiving room, still not fully awake. It's 7.20 a.m. I sit there in the receiving room for three hours. Finally, the marshals come. Now they want me to hurry. One of them chains me up. First, he shackles my feet. Then he puts chains around my waist, fastens the handcuffs to the chain, and handcuffs on my hands. I can barely walk or shuffle. Court, dull, gray, dull green. They are putting me into a bullpen. I don't know why they call it a bullpen, though I have often speculated. Attorney visit, one of the marshals calls as he opens the bar to let me out. We go out to the end of the hall. Evelyn is puffing and huffing. She always puffs and huffs when she's angry. In a few minutes, I know that she will begin pacing and tapping her feet. They're trying to force us to go to trial right away, she tells me. You know I've been busy drawing up motions for federal court. What do you mean federal court? Aren't we in federal court? 
Yes, but if the judge denies our motion motion for postponement, I will be I want to be ready to go straight to the circuit court. What is the circuit court? It was all Greek to me. That's where we appeal if the judge issues an unfavorable opinion. We go on talking. Evelyn is trying to explain to me, and I'm trying to explain to her that we can't possibly go to trial. There's no way in the world you can be ready to go to trial right now. I'm ranting. I know, I know, Evelyn replies. I rant and rave indignantly while Evelyn tries to explain the law to me. They call us to court. The judge is Gigliardi. He looks just like what he is, a racist dog. Saltine. <laughs> Kamal comes into the courtroom. I'm delighted to see him. He has aged. He's grinning, but under that grin, his face is hungry. I wonder what he's thinking. Bob Bloom, Kamal's lawyer, is up on his feet talking. He is asking for a postponement. Everything he says is logical. It makes sense. Evelyn gets up and starts to rap. She is talking pure, unmitigated truth and logic. The judge looks at the ceiling. I predict the outcome of the hearing and keep turning around to look at the audience. Friendly, familiar faces smiling at me. I don't want them to ever stop. The judge denies our motion, motion for a postponement. The judge denies all of our motions. I want to scream, dirty dog, slimy pig. You're not a judge. You're just another prosecutor. I look at the prosecutor. He's smug. His face is unreal, like a poster. He looks like a 1940 war poster. John Q. Public. I keep staring at him. Nobody could look that corny. He's like a ghost from the past. I'm convinced he doesn't know it's 1973. The lawyers ask for a joint meeting and the judge says yes, but make it short. The judge outlines the strategy for the appeals. What are our chances for the, for this appeal? I asked. There's a chance, Evelyn says. Slim, maybe, but there's a chance. If the courts are interested in justice, well, of course, they'll support our position. We, we all know how big and if it is. Next time we went to court five days later, it has snowed. The trees were bare and covered with ice. And though I don't like winter, it was a beautiful sight. As soon as I arrived in the courthouse, everyone was there to tell me the, court, the circuit court had denied all of our appeals. And Gigliardi was talking about going to trial that day. I just want you to understand there's no way I can adequately defend you on this short notice. I haven't had time to prepare trial pre-trial pre, pre no, motions. I haven't received no discovery material, and I haven't even had time to think about an appropriate defense because I haven't been able to find out the basic facts of the case. I just want you to know that. I know, I told her, and I know you're doing the best that you can. At any rate, Evelyn said, if worse comes to worse, you'll have a solid issue for appeal. It was a depressing picture. We clearly were railroaded. I went before the judge. Again, he was arrogant and belligerent, determined to force us to go to trial right away. Again, she asked the judge for a postponement, but her arguments fell on deaf ears. He ruled that we could have a joint conference later, but the trial would begin immediately. So I'm going to stop there. And we'll do part two after about a day or so. But going into federal court to Rikers Island, I'm telling you, that whole thing with the strip search. It's very dehumanizing, you know, and um, it's like an added element. You know, men go through a cavity search as well, from what I know, 
but they have one cavity. Well, technically two cavities to go through. Women have three. And so it's just can be dehumanizing, especially if you're a person who is innocent that hasn't done anything wrong, and now you're being subjected to this type of treatment. And this is the carceral state that we live in. And so, man, I would love to talk to Asada Shakur about her experiences, but this is some of the dark, nitty-gritty underbelly of our criminal justice system, or as some would say, the criminal injustice system. So, yeah, I just wanted to, you know, you know, make sure I got this in because this book is shining the light basically on our on our injustice system. And, you know, I am grateful for Asada writing her autobiography. So did you like the stream? Did you like the fact that I'm reading this so that other people can hear this and get this firsthand well, technically secondhand account of what she went through. This is why I asked you guys to like it so that it puts it out there more so that more people can hear and see this as well. I'll be getting into Dirty Choose by Michael Parenti in a day or so um, so that you guys can also have that content as well. And be sure to tune in to the JB show. I'm sorry, the JB Haunt show on Tuesday because I will be talking to Awkward and we'll be actually be talking about the criminal justice system. He's an activist and advocate for defunding the police, also one of the co founders of the 10 Demands for Justice. So we're going to be talking about that as well. And I just want to thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you for you know, subscribing. Did you subscribe yet? I really hope you did. Uh, my goal is to get to 3000 subs. And so hopefully I can do that by the end of May. I'm trying to get to 3000 by the end of May. And so yeah, I'm trying to do this gradually so that more people will be able to see and hear this revolutionary ideas as well as these ideas of theory that maybe they've never been privy to before. And I am appreciative to go through this route. Thank you so very much to the patrons on Coffee and Patreon, as well as members and people who send me mutual aid because without you guys, I wouldn't be able to do this on a regular basis. So thank you from the top and bottom of my heart because it means a whole lot so i just want to thank you for watching please continue to do the best you possibly can with whatever you have water your plants water yourselves leave the world better than you found it Mwah, forehead kisses and reading fundamental.